and let's go from current slide. All right. Any questions from anything that we did last time or in general? Okay. Where we were last time, if you have your books, on page 129, we're in chapter 5, uh, section 5.3, and, <clears throat> sorry, it's example 1 at near the top or top middle part of page 129. Okay, here is what it tells us to do. Now, it has nothing to do with this figure. Oh, ah, she's not here. But I will continue like this. But I'll try to remember next time to, uh, when she's back, I can't remember her name. It sits right here. Uh, what's that? Deidre. Okay. Um, she asked me to use something bigger than this to do the problems on. Do y'all want a bigger screen than than what you have here? Okay. All right. We'll go with this then. Find the weight of five kilograms. So what we're looking for, if I can get my pen activated, okay, we have, we're looking for the weight, that's a little w, that's the unknown, and it says of 5.00 kilograms. What is that a measure of? What does kilogram measure? Isn't that weight? Trick question. Is it? What is five kilograms measure? Say again. Kilogram measures mass, how much of an object there is. Weight is what's the gravitational pull on that mass. Okay? So this is the mass. Okay? Now, does anyone know the relationship between weight and mass? And it was one of the last things we did. Uh, and that actually, in this book, they used the symbol for weight to be F sub W, so not just W, F sub W. Other texts I've used use little w for weight. Anyone remember that formula? It's very, say again. Equals what? Of gravity, exactly. It's equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity which we use as G. Now, anytime you're on the surface of the Earth, which is where we are most of the time, that G is a constant. If you're in any other planet, a moon, or somewhere else, you don't have a different G. Okay, if you're in outer space, it'll be a different G. But anytime you're on the surface of the Earth, that G is fixed. Now, what unit is this? Kilogram? What system? It's the SI system. Yeah, it measures mass. The SI system. So what symbol, what value for G do we use in the SI system? It's a constant, and it's right at the top of page 129 if you got your books. Okay, the mass is 5.00 kilograms. And what's the acceleration due to gravity? 9.80 meters per second squared. Remember, an acceleration is also a distance divided by time divided again by the time. Meters per second squared. And if you do the math, what do you get? 49 .0. Anyone guess on the units? Obviously, it could be kilogram meter per second squared, which is a perfectly fine unit. But what is that also a measure of? Newton. So this would be 49.0 newtons. Very good. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay, say this again now. How many digits? Okay, is that what you mean? Okay, this has three significant digits. Any digit after a decimal point is significant. 
So this has three significant digits. This has three. Any digit after a decimal point is significant. So that has three. Okay? I say any. There are a few exceptions to that. So your answer must only have three, de three digits. So it comes out 49.0. Okay? So that has three significant digits. Okay? So it's not to what decimal place it's given. It's how many significant digits. Now, if this would have been 1 times 3, that would have rounded to 50, okay? If this would have been 5.0 times and 3 significant digits there, then that's only 2 and 3. That would still be 2 significant digits. So you have to go with the smallest number of significant digits you got. When you're multiplying or dividing, adding and subtracting these different rules, we're not going to be doing that much of those, okay? Good question, by the way. Now, I'm going to just erase parts of this because no reason to rewrite it all. Okay. Okay. Example two asks, find the weight of 12.0 slugs. So here you've gone out and dug up 12 slugs. No, no, that's not the kind of slugs we're talking about. Um, you have 12.0 slugs. Remember, slugs is hardly ever used. Why do we even give you an example like this? I just got, yes, we're familiarity sake, uh, but no one ever uses slugs. You'll never find the scale that's measured in slugs, you know, calibrated in slugs. They just don't, no one uses them, okay? But this book is giving you a problem. You got 12.0 slugs of mass, that is a mass unit, okay? What is its weight? Well, I left a little something there I guess I could erase. Got too much down there. Okay. The formula is still M times G. M is 12.0 slugs. And what is G? What what unit uh, in what system is slugs measured? US customary. Okay? And what what is the acceleration due to gravity in the US customary system? Also on the top of page 129. Second, 32.2. What units? Feet per second squared. Always has to be a length per time per time. Feet per second squared. Okay? When you multiply that out, what do you get? Anyone with a calculator? A little louder? I can't hear. 386. Now, there probably was a decimal with it, or was there? But, huh? 0.4? Okay, but you only have three digits there, three digits there, so you're correct to round to 386. And what would be the units? You could... Second? Okay, you could write slugs if you ha enjoy doing that. Feet per second squared, but no one uses those units. What do we use? Pounds. 386 pounds. Okay? Now, if you hadn't noticed, a slug is a pretty large mass. 12 slugs is already 386 pounds. That's about an average Alabama lineman, right? No, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Okay? That's pretty big. Okay? And so... A slug is a pretty large unit, okay? And they got 386 as well. Good for them. All right. Now, finally, <laughs> we've run down the slide, okay? Let's erase everything. That's not what I wanted. Okay. This is hard to see what these arrows are. Uh, let's erase everything on the slide.
Okay, we're finally hit this slide. Took us a while. Um, the title of this subsection is Weight Versus Normal Force. I guess versus is an okay word for this, but it's talking about sort of two different things. Okay? Now, weight is always the pull. Remember, a force is a push or a pull. The weight is a pull from the Earth's gravitational field or whatever gravitational field it is. So weight is always pointed downward. The acceleration due to gravity is always toward the center of the Earth. Always. So here we have a block on the table. One force acting on that block is the weight of the, uh, the force due to gravity. Gravity is pulling down on that block with a force of, the weight is, m times g. m is the mass of that block, whatever it is, times the acceleration due to gravity, in whatever units you're using. That's what the gravitational force is. But notice the block isn't moving. Now, if there's a net force on the block downward, it has to be accelerating downward. This one is not. Why do you reckon not? The table is pushing up on the block. Right? Now, here's a dumb kind of example. What if we had... You can laugh. A, say a 1 by 12 board, you know, a pretty wide board, but fairly narrow, and I ran it across from that table to that table, then climbed up on the stair from the stool here and stepped on it. Any ideas what would happen? Hey, 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 okay. It would bend a lot. No, it would probably break. And the reason is my force, the, the gravity pulling down on me, that force is greater than that 1 by 12 board could sustain. At best, it would sag like crazy and not break. Okay, okay. But you would definitely see it's trying to hold me up, but just can't. Okay? Now, if I put a 2 by 4 there, I mean a 2 by 12, that probably could. You might still have a little bit of a sag, but more than likely it wouldn't break. Because it has enough strength to push up against my weight, okay? This table is pushing up against that. That force that you don't really see, that's called the normal force. Now, earlier, I used F sub n to be the net force. <laughs> now they're using it for the normal force. So usually when you're talking about net force, you use a little n. Normal force, you use a capital N. Now, what normal means is perpendicular. Because the table is here, the perpendicular force of that is up like that. If this had been a ramp like this, the perpendicular force, the normal force would be that way. And probably be sliding down the table, okay, the ramp. But this is like that, the net force is up. And since there's no acceleration, right, the block's just sitting there. It's not sagging the table, it's just sitting there. Then you can conclude that the sum of the forces, the net force, is zero. And that would be... That would mean the normal force up is exactly equal to the weight down. Exactly equal. So that's what this figure is illustrating. Okay? Now. Okay. Here's something I think I've already been saying, but now the book is addressing it. Uh, and this doesn't have a figure with it, so I'll just do it on this figure like I've been doing the last several. Um, mass is considered to be what they call an invariant, a quantity that never varies. Okay? My mass right now, unfortunately, is the same mass it would be as if I went into outer space if I went and visited Jupiter, walked on the moon, whatever, my mass is my mass. It doesn't change. It's an invariant. But what would happen to my weight if I were walking on the moon? Would I weigh as much? No, because the gravitational attraction, the gravitational acceleration on the moon is about one-sixth of that on the Earth. 
So yeah, it wouldn't be the same. Okay, Jupiter, much greater. I'd probably be smashed. The trouble is, since Jupiter doesn't have a surface anyway, I'd just be sucked down into the gases and never seen again. Okay, so let's not go there. Okay, um, can't think of an object that has greater mass than the Earth uh, because all the giant planets are gases. Okay, they don't, they don't have the other. But your acceleration due to gravity depends on what gravitational field you're in, and that's how much mass the, the object you're on, which we live on the Earth, so that's always the same. Okay, so let's take, calculate the weight of an astronaut. And this astronaut happens to have a mass of 75 kilograms. Now, I'm not used to thinking in that, so let's see. Okay, and by the way, if you want a quick, rough estimate, uh, multiply by 2.2, and that would be how many pounds. Well, twice that would be 150, and 0.2 of that would be 15, so that would be 165. So this astronaut's probably a male uh, at 165 pounds, approximately. That's just an estimation. Okay? So an astronaut with a mass of 75 grams, what would his weight be on the Earth? F sub W on Earth, which is where we always assume. How would we get that? Just like you did before. Say again? Yeah, 75.0 kilograms times 9.80 units meters per second squared, and that would give you someone with a calculator, 700 what? 35? You probably had a decimal in there, uh, and it would round to 735, and what units? Anyone? Okay, you could say kilogram meter per second squared, or what other unit would that be? 735 newtons. So a newton is a fairly small unit of, of force. Because like I said, that was about 160 pounds, which is not 165 maybe. Uh, not all that heavy, but boy. So, I mean, it's the same weight, but a newton is a much smaller unit than a pound. Okay? Now, let's take that astronaut to the moon where the G on the moon uh, G on the moon is 1.63 meters per second squared. Same mass of the astronaut. So what would the weight of the astronaut be on the moon? Okay. It would be 75.0 kilograms. That doesn't change. His mass is the same everywhere he is, okay? Though his acceleration due to gravity on the moon is only 1.63 meter per second squared, okay? And what do you say that came out to? 122.25. Okay, now that's too many digits, so what will we round to? 122. Newtons, exactly. Kilogram meter per second squared. So where it has his weight on the Earth, 735 Newtons. On the Moon, only 122 Newtons. So if you want a weight loss plan that's guaranteed to work, go to the Moon, okay? You'll lose weight, but you don't lose any mass necessarily, so it really doesn't do you any good. When you come back to Earth, there it goes back up again. All right. 122 newtons. Excellent. Now, there is one little blurb at the bottom of the page with absolutely no examples or problems on it. Uh, do not confuse mass with volume. It's easy to confuse mass with weight. Some people also confuse it with volume. The volume of an object is a measure of the space it occupies, whereas the mass is how much stuff there is there. Okay? Um, Volume is usually me measured in cubic units, such as 
cubic um, centimeters, cubic meters, cubic feet, cubic yards, cubic inches, something like that. But also there are some other units that we sometimes use that imply volume but actually have their own unit. For instance, a liter. A liter is a capacity unit which measures the volume. Now let me give you a real quick correlation there, and I bet you most of you know it, some of you are in medical fields, right? One milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. My mom was a nurse, and back when she was in training, what they called cubic centimeters were cc's. So many cc's. cc's of this, that, and that. That's now, nowadays they usually use milliliters. If you have dosed any kids lately, you'll know they don't give it in cubic centimeters, usually in milliliters. Same measure, okay? That's the cubic thing, length times width times height. This is the capacity measure. Now, other capacities would be quarts, pints, gallons, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, those are all capacities or volume measurements, not mass measurements or weight measurements. Okay. They give sort of an example here. What if you had two identical storage boxes? Same height, same width, same depth, okay? Identically the same. Sealed up, sitting here on the floor. I say, could you haul these out for me? Looking at them, they have the same volume. Length times width times height is identically the same. But if one of them's filled with books and one of them's filled with uh, those styrofoam peanuts, when you go lift it, you know, nope, these are not the same. Different weights, same volume. So don't confuse weight with volume. Now, weights and masses are easier to confuse because here on the surface of the earth, they only differ by a constant, a multiplicative constant. So when one goes up, the other goes up. Those boxes have the same volume that can have very, very different weights, okay? That finishes 5.3. Any questions? Okay. 5.3 was mostly forces, uh, yeah, uh, weight, gravity and weight. Very short section. For homework, if you choose to do any, do either one or three. Those are pretty simple. Do any of the odds five through nine. Okay. And then do any of the odds 11 through 29. 11 is asking for weight, 13 is asking for, uh, 13 and 15 are asking for mass, uh, 17 is asking for weight, so just vary them up there, whatever ones you choose to do. Okay. Now most of those odds have the answers in the back. Something like 21 will not, because the back of the book doesn't know how much you weigh. Okay, so don't mess with that. Okay unless you want to for fun. Now let's talk about another topic, and this one is friction. Okay? What is friction? It produces heat, so there must be a lot of friction somewhere around here. I'm getting hot. Okay? What is friction? Okay. Uh, did you hear something there? Okay. Because you heard something, there had to have been some vibration, some resistance to the motion of that chair. And I could feel it. Because the chair is not that heavy, and it's not particularly rough. I could feel that there was definitely a force that was resisting my pushing the chair. Now, if this were a perfectly slick ice floor, and perfectly slick bottom of that, I could have just pushed a little bit and it was going fly. Well, the difference is there's more friction with this than there would be with ice. Even though this is a pretty smooth looking surface, if you look at it microscopically, there's little ridges and humps and valleys in that, even in this top. And those uh, feet on this chair, uh, they tend to fall into that pretty easily. That seems to be a rubber-like material 
and that will fall into and sculpt itself to the floor, and then it's hard to move it because the peaks in the valley are resisting each other. Okay? So, friction is a measure of that resistance to motion. Okay? So your definition was better than mine. A force that resists the relative motion of two objects in contact uh, caused by the irregularities of the two surfaces, like I just described, explained, sliding or rolling across each other. And those tend to catch up, to catch on each other, and therefore you have resistance. Okay. Um, this tractor is trying to push this block with the shovel. Okay. And it's pushing, hasn't quite got there yet, but it's going to push hard. So here is the motion. Okay, it's coming this way. However, the block isn't wanting to move. Okay? Or it's moving very slowly. The only reason that keeps it from moving, there has to be an opposing force, and that force is friction. Okay? Anytime you have motion, okay? I want to say any time. There are maybe some circumstances not. There's usually an opposing force that's retarding that motion. Remember, we talked about Aristotle uh, and Galileo. Aristotle said anything on the surface of the Earth, terrestrial motion, is going to tend to stop. Okay? Well, what he was seeing was frictional forces re res resisting the motion of the object. Okay? And he said celestial bodies, stars and planets and stuff, they just keep on moving, okay? So he said there's two different sets of rules, one for on Earth and one for up there. No, there's one set of rules, but up there you have no friction, down here you do. Okay? I say no friction. If you were to look at the blow up the contact area between the floor and the uh, block, that floor is probably concrete or something like that. A lot of irregularities in it. And more than likely, the box or block or whatever it is has some irregularities too. Now they show them to be as much as this, and what they're showing is very little resistance. It's when this valley goes down into that valley, you get a lot of resistance. Right here on the peaks, it's not a lot of resistance, but when this falls down in here and this over here, then you run into a bunch of resistance, and it all averages out, and that is the opposing force, friction, and here's the other thing. Wherever your motion is, friction always opposes the motion. Okay? Now, I'm going to try this one. If I were to push on this desk, I am pushing on the desk, but it's not moving, is it? Well, then it has to have a frictional force exactly equal to my push. And if I push a little the frictional force is a little. If I push harder, the frictional force is harder. Then if I ever do get it moving, and I don't know if you've had this happen before, you push on something, you push on something, and then suddenly it gives you almost fall down. Well, that's because there's two types of frictional forces. One is static friction, and the other is kinetic friction. Static means stationary, kinetic means kinesiology, moving, right? And generally, Static friction for the same two surfaces, the maximum static friction is usually greater than the kinetic friction. And here's why. Static friction, these grooves are going to find their way down there and it's going to settle out and it's going to take a lot of force to get it moving. But once it's moving, then they sort of skip along the top and there's a lot less frictional resistance. Okay? So the maximum static friction is usually greater than kinetic friction. We call the quantity the coefficient of static or kinetic friction. Okay? Now, I don't know what these arrows mean like that. I saw them there, I see them here, whereas this is just an arrow here and an arrow there. What I think is this is it. It starts small and then it's bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the only thing I can figure out until finally you start moving, okay? Uh, and when it's stationary, the static friction is usually greater, maximum static friction is usually greater than the kinetic friction. 
Now, I keep saying maximum static friction. Remember when I push a little? The static friction is a little. That's not the maximum. The maximum is what it gets to right before it moves, okay? That would be the maximum static friction. That's usually greater than the kinetic friction. One point, I've got to move back here, otherwise I'll be against the wall. Okay. Now, this is sort of saying the same thing I just did. If you exert a little force, now we're pushing that way, friction is always opposite the motion. Okay? So the friction force is that way. If this is static friction, those are exactly equal. You don't have any net movement. Okay? But if you have a larger friction force, you have to push larger against it, you may still not have any motion. If they equal each other, or if they balance each other static-wise, then those are equal and opposite. Okay? Now, okay, that's on down the road, uh, literally. So let's use this one to build on. Okay? Now, I said usually the book says is. Okay? They say here, okay, three topics on friction. Do most of you have your books? You do, don't you? Okay, you don't. So I probably need to write these down. Okay. So? Uh, all right. Okay, first. Friction is a force. We know that. I can't write well. <laughs> really bad. Friction is a force, okay, that always, two things that it always does, okay, acts parallel to, that's going to be my symbol for parallel, to the surface area, or to the surface in contact, Okay, and that's the first thing. It's always parallel to the surface and opposite in direction. Remember, forces are vector quantities that have directions with them, opposite to the direction of the motion. Whether it's actually moving or trying to move always opposite, parallel to the surface and opposite to the force trying to get it to move. Okay, that's the one. Number two, and I said usually they say is. Static friction, I can't write. Okay. They say is greater than kinetic friction. Okay, and number three, friction increases as the force between the surfaces increases. Oh, where'd you go? Okay. Now, let me... I think we did the first one okay. Um, I did mention it acts parallel to the surface uh, in contact, so I told you it was always opposite direction of motion. Second one, I said static friction is usually greater than kinetic friction. Yeah. Done properly, it's say greater than or equal to. I don't think kinetic friction is ever greater. can't think of any time it's greater than, but it could be equal to. 
But they say he's afraid of them, so leave it that. Okay, the third one I did this was illustrating it, but we didn't I didn't focus on it. The friction increases as the force between the surfaces increase. Okay? Now remember our diagram before. There's a force due to gravity pulling down on this crate, but there's an equal and opposite force, normal force pushing up. Okay? Now, if you have two identical crates that are stacked on each other, then this has more force down, so there's more force up, so the um, force between the surfaces increases. In other words, those valleys and peaks are pushed down into each other harder, and it's harder to get on the move. Okay? So that is going to, for a, to get it to move, you have to increase your effort force because the friction force is going to increase proportionally to the weight. Okay? So the greater the weight, the greater the friction force. Now here's kind of the interesting part. Now the book isn't going to go into it, but I'll tell you now. Friction force isn't really proportional to the surface area, only to the weight. So if you took this crate and moved it down here, then it's going to be closer to that, okay? Because there's less, you know, this, this, if those are identical crates, just increasing the surface area isn't necessarily going to increase the frictional force. So that would act more like this than putting them on top of each other. That really creates more normal force. So in other words, the force, the friction force, is proportional to the normal force. That's what we're getting to. The frictional force, and that's usually F sub F, capital F for force, little f for friction. Now, have y'all seen this symbol before is proportional to? I can't remember. I don't think we've said it, but have you run into it ever in your life? It's proportional to the normal force. Now, usually the normal force is related to the weight, but it's whatever the total force is the surface is pushing up against. And to give you an equality, you need a constant proportionality, so the frictional force is equal to mu times the normal force. Okay? Mu is the coefficient of friction. But as I alluded to before, there's two. There's static friction and kinetic friction. So if you've got no motion, you're just pushing then uh, with no motion, then the frictional force is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. Okay? Now, what that would mean, that's the maximum force that you have to exert before you get motion to happen. Okay? Once you have motion happening, then the frictional force is mu sub k times the normal force. Okay? But mu sub k is generally less than mu sub s. The book says always, I say generally, they're less than or equal to. Okay? So this is how you have. That's why you push, you push, you push, and finally when it starts moving, it moves easier because now you're into uh, the kinetic friction rather than um, static friction. Okay? Now, I don't think, you know, I'm sure they don't have this table. If you got your text, goodness, this is a painful place to sit. They give some of these mu's, coefficients of friction. Steel on steel, okay? The static friction would be 0.58, the kinetic friction 0.2. Much less kinetic than you have static. Steel on steel, when you lubricate it, <laughs> is 0 0.13, 0 0.13. So in that case, the static friction is equal to the kinetic friction, okay? So I wish they'd have said less than or equal to, not, I mean greater than or equal to, not always greater. Glass on glass, believe it or not, that's 0.95 static, 0 0.40 kinetic. This is your mu. Hardwood on the hardwood, 0 0.40 um, static, 0 0.25 kinetic. So most of the time, 
It's the net static is greater than kinetic. Steel on concrete. They don't give a static, they just give kinetic 0 0.30. Okay. Aluminum on aluminum, they only give static 1.9. That's a pretty big uh, coefficient there. Rubber on dry concrete, 2.0, as opposed to kinetic 1.0. What difference would that make? Is that good, bad, or indifferent that you have such a high um, coefficient of static friction of rubber on dry concrete? Say again? It's good. Okay, why? When you're driving, exactly. You want that always to be static friction. You want that road, the, the tire surface, to hit the road and not slide. Okay? And that's why when you go into a slide, ease off. In fact, you're, if you have a, what do they call the brake, braking system? Second? And, yeah, anti-lock brakes and those kind of things. They have another name for it too. I can't think of what it is now. But that, the system automatically re, re, releases some of the forces so you go back to the static case. You don't want to maintain sliding friction, okay? You always want to go back. And that's why you should, if you start sliding, you should ease off your accelerator, okay? Now, rubber on wet concrete, the static friction drops to 1.5. The kinetic friction drops to 0.97, okay? What's the ramifications there? When it's wet, slow down, okay? Because you don't have that static. It's much easier to skid in water than it is in dry concrete. Okay? Aluminum on wet snow. Uh, 0.4 is the static friction. 0 0.02 is the kinetic friction. That is really small. Now, where would that come into an advantage? If you were... Aluminum on wet snow. Skiing, of course. You want the speed then. You don't want to have much friction. Okay, so you want to get it up to the kinetic. However, when you're coming to a stop, you're wanting to get some static. Okay, so uh, you try to do something else to produce that. Now, steel on Teflon. Pretty interesting. Teflon, by the way, another name for that is the nonstick pans, right? And the reason they don't stick, they have very low coefficients of friction. 0 0.04, both for static and kinetic. Okay. They have a try this activity, which is probably pretty good to look at. We don't have time to do it, but uh, if you want to look at it and try it, you certainly may. It might give you added insight. But in general, here are four things they say to do to reduce uh, kinetic friction. Okay, so I think I'll... Let me see if there's another... Nope, still not. Okay. Okay. In general, to reduce kinetic friction, number one, this is if you don't like the friction you got, Use smoother surfaces. Okay? That's pretty lousy writing. Okay? If you're trying to reduce friction, try to create a, you know, use a smoother surface. Uh, my wife, I used to joke about her. I said, she never feels like a plant or a piece of furniture is happy unless it moves frequently. Okay? This is shortly after we were married. She was always trying to get the best set up. And, nah, I don't like it this way. Yeah, let's try it. This. Nah, that's not quite right. You know, we were always moving furniture. Now, being the lazy person that I am, we found that if you get a slicker surface, like maybe put um, polyethylene under it, and then it's easier to pull that furniture around than 
otherwise. Okay? So use smoother surfaces. Okay? That's one. Certainly another one would be, but this wouldn't be good in moving furniture, this would be in your car engine, is use lubrication. Um, to reduce, uh, to provide a thin film between the surfaces. And this is exactly why you put oil in a car, grease on bearings. You want a thin film in between there so you have less friction. Because where you have friction, you have heat. Where you have friction, you wear down bearings and other things. Not good. So use lubrication. Okay? Number three. Use Teflon. Look at that on the table. Some of the lowest coefficients you have. Use Teflon to greatly reduce friction between surfaces when an oil lubricant is not decided desirable, such as in electric motors. So, let me go back and just say use Teflon. If a, um, if oil or grease not desirable. Okay, so again, that's sort of like what we were using with polyethylene or something like that to slide it across the floor rather than use, use Teflon. Now, I don't know if any of you have been in this situation before, but you can go to the store and buy these casters that you can set under the feet of things and really move things around nicely. And we have a bunch of those sitting around, though she's gotten satisfied with where her furniture is, uh, but it's nice to know they're there, the older I get, because uh, Sometimes those casters are Teflon, and they tend not to scar floors or hurt floors, uh, so that would be a pretty good thing to use. And then number four, substitute rolling friction for sliding friction. Substitute rolling friction for sliding friction. Okay. Now, this almost seems counterintuitive, but rolling friction usually is static, not dynamic, or not kinetic. But, rolling friction uses the positive parts of friction. It keeps it from skidding, okay, but it moves and the rolling takes all the weight off of it. I mean, remember friction was proportional to the normal force, but with rolling friction, it doesn't matter how heavy it is, it's not going to increase the rolling friction by that much. So that's usually a good thing. So uh, when we, when they were too heavy at an object to do, we went out and got a cart and strapped it in and rolled it across. Way better than sliding it across the floor. You just got to get it up on the, what do you call those things? Hand, I, I can't think of the name of it. Okay. Let's see. Let's move to example one. It has a figure here, but it's not in the slide set. So we'll maybe use these if we can. Okay. A force of 170 newtons. I'm going to call this an applied, well, I'll leave it, I'll just leave it force. 170 newtons. Okay. Is needed to keep a, three, a 530 newton wooden box. So when they phrase it that way, that means the weight of that box is 530 newtons. Okay? 
Now we're going to assume, well, that's not for now. Okay. A force of 170 newtons is needed to keep a 530 newton bo wooden box sliding on the wooden floor. So what kind of deal are we dealing with here if it's sliding? Static or kinetic? We're dealing with kinetic, okay? Uh, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction? And they asked the right question there. Okay, so it says, let's just use this picture here. This is your 170 newton push on the block, okay? This has a weight, F sub W, of 530 newtons, right? Yeah. Now, if the gravity is pulling down with that, what must the floor be, be pushing up with? Since it's not sinking into the floor or flying off the floor, it must be equal and opposite. So the normal force is... 530 newtons. Okay? Now, the question is, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction? Mu sub k, that's what we're looking for. That's the unknown. Do you remember the formula that relates the applied force to the normal force? Okay, applied force is equal to mu sub k times the normal force, exactly, okay? So, what we have here is this one and this one, so you can either solve for mu sub k literally, or you can plug the numbers in and solve numerically. I don't care. Which one would you rather do? Plug and chug or chug and plug? I don't care. Plug in numbers first? Is that what you said? Okay. So this would be while 170 newtons is equal to mu sub k, that's what we're looking for, times your 530 newtons. And how would you solve for, k, for mu sub k? Anybody? You want mu sub k, that's what you're looking for. How do we get it? Divide both sides by 530 newtons. And notice the newtons go out, the 530 newtons go out over here. That leaves you mu sub k. And by the way, mu's, your coefficients of friction, dimensionless quantities. There are no dimensions to them. And sure enough, the newtons cancel out. They don't have any. So what is your uh, 170 divided by 530? You can make it even easier to say 17 divided by 53 because the zeros you could just cancel out. What you get? Point what? Point 0.32. Zero point 0.32. No units with it. Now, did that come out exactly? Three zero. Okay. Now, why didn't you use more digits? And this is what I was going to say earlier. It's not clear here whether this is two or three significant digits and whether this is two or three significant digits. Usually in this book, if that's a third significant digit, they're going to put a bar over it. They didn't, so you only have two significant digits, so 0 0.32 is why they rounded to that. Now, Looking at our table, I don't see anything very close to it. That may have been hardwood on the hardwood or something like that. Does that make sense? And they got 0 0.32. All right, and you're absolutely right. anti lock black brakes are the right words. The physics connection, since the invention of automobile, engineers have worked to design brakes that reduce the stopping distance for automobile. The most impressive advance in that technology is anti-lock braking system, ABS. That keeps your brakes from sliding, going from static to kinetic friction because the coefficient is less and it will move faster. 
Now, one thing they haven't been able to figure out is how to keep an object from hydroplaning. Uh, have you all heard of that? Okay, that's basically when you get a surface of water and you basically get on the surface of water, there, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to be almost out of control. And I actually have had that happen to me once. I was, uh, many years ago, close to 25, I guess, um, I was working part-time at Jeff State and left in the morning to go head to, I think I was going to the uh, Shelby campus, and uh, it was pouring down the rain. I thought, oh, this, the uh, expressway is going to be backed up. I'm not even going to get on it. I'm going to go surface roads all the way. But I went out to a place where I could see the expressway, and it was moving. I thought, well, okay, I'll get on it. It saved me a little bit of time. So I went and got on the expressway, and just after we crested a hill, I looked, and all I saw in front of me was a wall of brake lights, okay? Somebody, something had happened somewhere, and the car in front of me veered to the left and filled in a little gap here. The one, uh, two cars in front, this one put up there. I had nowhere to go, so I just hit the brake and tried to get toward the side without hitting the thing, and there just wasn't room. And when I hit the brakes, I actually sped up because the tires on the road gave me static friction, but when I hit the brakes, then it started skiing on the water, okay, and literally did. It, it felt like I was speeding up, and I had nothing on the accelerator. It was, you know, and I uh, messed up my front headlight and his back light, but the bad news was my airbag went up. Everything was fixable except the airbag. Airbags are really expensive. They totaled the car just because the airbag. It was an older car, but uh, not super old, but that's what did it. And the police officer said they were all over the city that way that morning, so there weren't any fault attributed to it. Okay, that finishes five point whatever we were on. Four? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, 5.4 friction. You can do any of the problems, one through, odd problems, one through 15. I'll let you decide which ones and how many. Now, there is another blurb called New Technologies here, hydrophobic metals that also re uh, reduce frictions, and basically one of these has been, that's what Teflon is, okay? It's not really a metal, but it's a coating to a metal, and it uh, resists water or other things, so it beads it up and provides a, a surface. Okay, I won't go any more into that. Okay. All right. Just one more thing here, and this is 5.5 .5 is total forces in one dimension. And that's as far as we're going to go in forces. Okay? How are we doing in time? Not great. But. Okay. When a force acts in the same or opposite directions in one dimension, the total or the net force can be found by adding the forces if they're pushing in the same direction or subtracting forces that act in opposite directions. That sort of makes sense, right? We saw that with here. Force in that direction, equal and opposite force in that direction, zero net force, okay? But if there had been two people pushing on that and no friction underneath, that would have moved greater, okay? Uh, it's often useful to draw forces as vectors. Forces are vectors, and when it's helpful, definitely use vectors to represent. So here we have two workers. One's a big, look like pretty strong guy, the other one's sort of a scrawny guy, okay? They push in the same direction, that's to the right, on a crate. The force exerted by one worker is 150 pounds. The force exerted by the other is 175 pounds. Find the net force exerted, okay? So let me... Um, 
Let's erase everything to begin with. And let's say this is what we have the workers pushing on. The big guy, okay, this is a pretty ugly guy, right? Okay. The big guy here is pushing with 175 newtons in that direction. And the smaller guy here is pushing, okay, with 150. Where that zero is significant, they put the bar over it. Uh, Newton force. So what's the net force being pushed on the box? Pretty simple. My second, 325. So the net force, and I usually use a little n, is equal to 325 newtons. Yeah, you just add them if they're in the same direction. Okay? Now, the work is pushed in one direction, the static friction puts in the opposite direction, so we add the forces by the workers, but have to subtract the force. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, example two, sorry about that. Example two, the same two workers push the brake to the right, and the motion is opposed by a static frictional force of 300 pounds. I uh, don't like the way that's worded. If they would have said 400 pounds, I'd have been okay with it. Because if it, okay, because then they're not moving it, okay? But when it says static frictional force of 300 pounds, they're pushing with 325, it's not going to be static anymore. They've overcome that, and it goes to kinetic. But that's not what they're meaning. They just mean frictional force. I wish they wouldn't have said static friction. That would have made it better. If they had just said opposed by a frictional force of 300 pounds, so now you have uh, 325 newtons in that direction and 300 newtons in that direction. What's the net force on it now? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Now, <laughs> newtons. Now, in the book it said to the right. Our figures here are showing to the left, so I'm not going to put the... No, but wait, I'm sorry, I misread the whole problem. I don't know why they changed on me, but they put this in pounds. It doesn't change anything except the units, okay? Still works the same. Uh, this was pounds, this was pounds, this was pounds, this was pounds. I can't write. This is pounds, and this is pounds. Okay, pounds, not. I was wondering, where did I get the 25 pounds? It was 20. Okay, no, that's where we got it. If you had more force pushing to the left, less to the right, you have a net force uh, to the left. Their problem is to the right, but I just wasn't going to change the arrows. Okay, now. Remember when we were talking about significant digits? When you multiply or divide, you go for the least. This was an ad addition and subtraction. All you do is keep the nearest pound. That's the important thing here. So your answer, the net force is 25 pounds. You don't put 25.0. That wasn't a multiplication or a division, so you don't keep the same number of significant digits. So you had three here, three there, uh, and this 300 pounds here, that was three significant digits. If you're multiplying or something like that, yeah, you come out with three significant digits. If you're adding and subtracting, you stay with the minimum unit, or actually maximum unit. Everything was in pounds, you leave it in pounds. Okay. Now here's example three. We're going to use the same crate in example two, and we're going to say that crate has a mass, so the mass of the crate is 5.00 slugs. Remember, there aren't any abbreviations for slugs. What is the acceleration when the workers are pushing against the frictional force? Well, what is acceleration? Well, I mean, how is acceleration related to mass and 
net force. Remember that one? Say again? Yeah. Oh, okay, you're doing acceleration equals. That's good to do because that's... Ooh! Yeah, okay. The acceleration is equal to the net force, and that's why I put in there divided by the mass. And since we're in pounds, a pound, and this is the net force now, 25, this will be slug feet per second squared. Don't usually use that, but that's what it is, divided by 5.00 slugs. And what do you get as an answer? 5.0. Two significance there, three there, go with the lower. 5.0, what unit? Feet per second squared. So that's its acceleration. Good for you. Perfect answer. Okay, notice we use the conversion factor to change the, the acceleration units. Now, two workers push in the same direction on a large pallet. The force exerted by one is... 645 newtons, so this is very similar to what we just did, only now we're going to be in newtons. So let's erase all this. Two workers pushing in the same direction on a large pile. I should have left the workers in there. I don't want to draw them again. Here's worker one, okay. Okay, here's worker two. He's short, okay. Okay, and exerted by one worker is 600, so he'll be pushing with 645 newtons, and the other is exerting, pushing with 755 newtons. Okay, whoa, what was I doing? Okay. The motion is opposed by a frictional force of 1175 newtons. This is 1175 newtons. Okay? Find the net force. The net force is the sum of all the forces. And what would that be? 755 newtons plus 645 newtons. Minus, because that's in the opposite direction, 1175 newtons. Will these two add to 1400 minus 1175? And that gives you 225. Buy it? Okay, good deal. And that's what they got to. That finishes 5.5. Work on any of the odd number problems, 1 through 13, okay? And I guess, I kept go going here, this is the illustration of one of the problems, I think. But for right now, I can't see it. No, I'm sorry. This is 5.6. I thought we were almost through, but we're not. Okay, 5.6. This is referring to 5.6. Law of action and reaction. Now, if you remember, and I can't remember for sure, we had Newton's first law of motion, which is the law of inertia. Object at rest tends to stay at rest, or if it's in motion, stay in motion, same velocity, same direction, unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. Second law is if it is acted on by an unbalanced force, then it accelerates, it changes its motion, it changes its velocity, okay? But we never got to the third law. 5.6 gets us to the third law. Can we do anything with it? What do we got? Oh, we got five minutes, right? Okay, I can't see that clock very easily. Okay, let's see if we can finish this up. Uh, when an automobile accelerates, we know that a force is being applied to it. Why? The only way you get an acceleration is if you have a net force on it. Okay? 
What it applies this force? You may think that the tires exert the force on the auto. No, the tires are exerting a force on the road. Okay? The tires are part of the auto. Uh, the tires move along with the auto, and therefore there must be a force applied to them also. The ground below the tires actually supplies the force that accelerates the car. That is called a reaction force to the force exerted by the tires on the road, which is the action force. The third law of motion, the law of action-reaction, can be stated, I guess I need to write it, for every force applied, I can't write, applied to an object A, By, no, I'm sorry, yeah, applied by object A to object B, I'm trying to do it the way the book does, for every force applied by object A to object B, that's the action force, then there is... an equal but opposite force exerted by B to A. Where is this going? Okay, that's your reaction force. Notice equal and opposite. Now I heard, read somewhere, that Newton expressed it this way. If I push on a rock, the rock pushes on me. Okay, that means action. Okay, so for every force that I exert on the rock, the rock is exerting an equal and opposite force on me or table, or whatever you're dealing with. That's action-reaction. Now, um, what they show here is a car with the tires pushing against the road. That's the action force. That's the 500-pound. Uh, no. 100 pound is the car tire pushing against the road. The 500 pounds is the road pushing against the tire. Now that doesn't seem fair except that the road, is, the tire is fastened on the road. Now that's not equal and opposite, okay? So I don't know what the figure is here. Okay, it's not, boy, especially to have just given you that, it's not fair to give you a picture like this, okay? What they have left out is 400 pounds that they haven't mentioned. If the tires are pushing against the road uh, with 500 pounds of force this way, now the road pushing against the tires are 500 pounds this way, tires pushing against the road with 100 pounds that way, that means there has to be 400 more pounds somewhere here. Um, there's more involved than what you see, okay? Uh, so I really don't like this illustration at all. Um, so let's actually go to the next one. Oh. Is probably almost as bad. Um, have you ever fired a weapon? Okay, most of you have. Uh, I grew up on a farm. We had rifles to kill snakes and that kind of stuff. Um, I was in the Navy. I was actually a gunnery officer. 
So I had to be qualified on pistols and the other things. And when you fire a weapon, there's always a kick, a recoil, exactly. And what it is, you're exerting a force, the, the explosion of the uh, gunpowder in the bullet is sending the bullet forward. The action on the bullet is F1, and I, re I don't like the pictures, okay? Because F2 has to be equal and opposite to F1. And this is correct. F1 is equal to the negative of F2. Absolutely. But this action on F2 is against your hand, okay? And if you're just doing this, then you've got a lot of give. If you're doing this, you've now got both hands on it. So you, you can exert more, uh, you can steady it. And that's why when you see the cop shows, they do it like this. They're trying to steady their aim, so you don't get as much kick. So when they fire more than one round, they're aiming pretty much at the same target. In rifles, deal is the same thing. If you have a high-powered rifle, and you hold it like this, off your shoulder, through shoulder. Separated shoulder, okay? Because it's going to be equal and opposite reaction, okay? But that's because the gun itself has a very low, fairly low mass. The bullet is much lower, okay? But if you hold it against your body, tight against your body, that's what you're supposed to do. Now the reaction is against not just the rifle, but you and the rifle. So you have a lot more resistance. Still the same force, it's just you have a bigger mass making a less acceleration. Okay? So that's what they're dealing with there. And this, actually, that's about all they write on this. Uh, except they have two things. Try this activity. If uh, it's a pretty interesting, blow up a balloon and release it. What happens when you release a balloon? If what? The air comes out, but what does the balloon do? It goes all over the place, right? And the only reason it goes all over the place, it has a floppy nozzle. So it's always going in the opposite direction of the nozzle's pointing. So that's why it takes off like crazy. They show you put it on a, uh, put a tube on a wire, stretch like this, and tie the balloon to it, blow it up, and then release it. Then it's got to go in one direction. Believe it or not, the next example, physics connection, shows the shuttle takeoff. Of course, this is fairly old. We don't have a shuttle anymore. But any rifle takeoff, uh, rocket takeoff, guess what? That's the same principle as this. Re action, reaction. The exhaust blows this way, or the air comes out of the balloon that way, the balloon takes off that way. Action, reaction. That finishes Chapter 5. Now, there are three formulas listed, four formulas, well, there's only three. Okay, number two, three, and four. Okay, I don't know where one is. Uh, on page 140, there's some review questions that you might find useful, but more than that, the review problems on page 141. And I think, I think they have odd numbers of those in the back, but let me check. The review problems may have all the answers. The review questions have all the answers. Review problems also have all the answers. So for your review problems and questions, all the answers are in the back. At the end of each section, it's only the odds. Okay? Those would be good things to study. Okay? We're jumping next, I think, to chapter 12. Is that not right? Now, if I had known we were going to finish tonight, I would have had your... No, we go to chapter 8. Okay? I would have had your test ready. I have it ready, I just don't have it run off. If you want to hang around, I'll go see if I can find the copy machine, but if not, I can give it to you on Tuesday. What you feel? I have a feeling they're all gone, but want me to check? They'll give you an extra weekend to work on it? Huh? Okay, so let me see if I can find it quickly here. I didn't have it separated because I thought, okay, actually, I have several copies already made. 
That's my original. Four of you want it right now? If you have to go. Okay. Let me go see if I can get others. Oh, she did. Yeah, I got her in the office. I got you. I need to give you this. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You seem to be really on top of this. <laughs> uh, is it going too fast, too slow, or is it okay? No, what I did was like the week before class started, uh -huh. I went on and ordered my book off Amazon uh -huh. and started refreshing. It was like I haven't did it now for quite some time. Right. Thank you.